Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rails Online Roundtable uh, eRead Illinois Data Project. My name is Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Director of Marketing and Communications. Uh, again, one more time, this event will be recorded. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of the rundown of how this is going to work. So uh, we're going to do some very, very quick updates from Rails. Uh, and then we will turn things over to Quinn McKissick, uh, who will be giving the presentation. Uh, Quinn will present, then we'll do a Q&A, um, and then we will do uh, kind of a wrap up at the very end. Uh, so just some really quick Rails updates, uh, something that I wanna share with you all. Um, Freedom Lifted. So, uh, uh, so we have a program that is available for anyone working in a Rails member library. Uh, it is called Social Justice in Public Libraries, and it's from Freedom Lifted. Um, this is a wonderful resource for any, uh, any staff member from any Rails member library that's looking for uh, training in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and one of the great things about it is it's a completely asynchronous course that allows you to go through at your own pace. The materials are very approachable. You can do it alone, you can do it a group, uh, with whatever you want to do. Um, and uh, again, anyone with an L2 uh, username and login um, has access to this resource right now. Uh, so we recently did a survey of participants, people that have been using the program uh, since we got it. Uh, we started it back in November and we've had almost unanimous positive feedback. It's been really, really positive for people. So if you haven't already done so, please go check it out. Um, again, have your L2 information ready and you can sign up. Just want to tell you about one other Rails webinar that we have coming up. Um, in about a month, we have a presentation from Nick Tanzi. Um, Nick Tanzi uh, has been is a frequent speaker for Rails, um, and he does a really wonderful job. He's uh, this um, in June. He's going to be talking about all things AI. I'll be talking about how to identify AI generated content, how to figure out what is real, what is not, um, what kind of other resources that you can share with your public. Um, this is a Zoom webinar. You can find it on L2. Look in the L2 calendar for this event. It takes place Thursday, June 13th, uh, 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, so please do take a look for that. Okay, so those are my updates. Uh, and I'm really excited to now turn things over to Quinn. Quinn McKissick is the Rails Data uh, Analysis Intern. Uh, I saw Quinn give a version of this presentation, and it's really, really great information. Um, if you are attending the Rails board meeting on uh, next Friday, which um, I'm not sure a whole lot of you will be, but Quinn will be doing a very similar presentation. Um, but we wanted to bring it to a more uh, library-facing audience, uh, library worker-facing audience. So, Quinn, I'm going to stop sharing, um, and you are welcome to take over. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. And are you seeing my screen now? Yep, looks great. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you all so much for taking the time to uh, hear some of my insights that I'll be sharing today. Um, first, a general overview. Like Dan said, I'm currently a data analysis intern at Rails, and I've been working on this project as I finish up the last semester of my LIS degree with sort of a focus on cataloging and data analysis. So I was really excited to work on this project because it really aligns with sort of the things that I've been studying. Um, I'm sure y'all are generally familiar with eRead already, but I, I just wanted to give sort of the basic points of that began in 2013. And the vendor that we're working with on this is Baker and Taylor using their Boundless platform. Um, overall, uh, I've gotten to spend a lot of time on this project, which is very exciting. And some of the challenges and I guess caveats before I jump into data is this is a pretty large data set, right? It's, the program's been going on for over a decade. So at this point, we're at millions of CERCs. And right, Baker and Taylor has changed the way they do things over time. And so a lot of our data is inconsistent. And so a lot of what I've been focused on is writing computer programs that can help us parse through this really, really large data set and find the interesting information there. So I wanted to start off by giving some of these big numbers from this is the calendar year of 2023, right? Again, when I say e-read uh, is really large, we have a lot of circulations, a lot of libraries, and a lot of users. So just right, sort of keeping this in the mind, in the back of your mind, we've got a pretty big data set. So first, I want to talk a little bit about trends from 2023, especially in circulation. 
So we're seeing that most of our circulation for e-read is coming for public libraries, almost exactly three quarters. Our next largest is those school libraries. And then this other category is things like our special libraries, academic libraries, government organizations, et cetera. And then I also wanted to break down 2023 circulation by um, the audience and fiction, nonfiction. So you can see here, right, a little more than half of the circulation is adult fiction. It goes adult, children's, and teen, and unsurprisingly, in all of those categories, fiction is a lot more popular than nonfiction. And in that vein, I thought I would show, right, some of our top genres and top titles in those genres for each of those demographic groups. So first, we've got the adult ones here. I won't read through all of these, but I found it interesting that um, it definitely seems to me, right, like that the trends in very popular things in e-read reflect, right, gener larger general circulation trends, right? We've got, unsurprisingly, these big categories of sort of your true crime mystery type stuff and romance. And then, right, our, this is the actually the only nonfiction genre that makes an appearance here is our biography and memoir, which is our most popular adult nonfiction. And we see, right, uh, the 2023 big hits of Prince Harry's memoir and Jeanette McCurdy's. So I'm sure um, you all recognize some of these titles at a glance. Um, but I think it's interesting to compare this adult versus the children's, right? Um, and we're seeing a really, really large popularity specifically in comics and graphic novels. And we can also see there's some crossover here with genre. Our humor is also Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Again, not shockingly very popular and unshockingly, oh, Harry Potter also very, very popular. And then finally, we've got our top teen genres, right, which is our sort of our sci-fi fantasy, crime mystery, also some romance. This social themes is a bisat category that generally seems to be like sort of buildings Roman fitting in type of stories. Um, and we can see, right, Sarah J. Mass, and both of these are, are Jenny Han really dominating. Again, these titles probably look familiar to you, but I think it's interesting to see some of our most popular categories and titles. So now I want to zoom out not just um, from 2023 and look at sort of our circulation trends more broadly. So since 2014, right, I cut off slightly there from 2013 because it was a half year, um, we can see that circulation rose pretty steadily and then we had this big peak 2019-2020, right, I wonder what happened there. <laughs> And since then, uh, circulation has gone back down a little and is roughly back at the 2019 levels. So, right, seems like we had a pandemic bubble that burst. And I think it's interesting to zoom in a little here, specifically on those most recent years. And I've divided it up here by library category. So we've got school libraries in the, or, sorry, public libraries in the light green here, school libraries in the dark green. And right, the first thing you'll probably notice is that, again, unsurprisingly, uh, school libraries have big peaks and dips based on the academic year, right? So we've got um, these dips, obviously, in the summer, and then these big peaks in the fall, and then a smaller peak around the start after winter break. Um, and it's worth noting, right, that since sort of that 2020 bubble, our public library circulation has largely actually remained pretty stable at almost exactly the 2019 level. And that drop that we're seeing, we are seeing a little bit of a drop in circulation for school libraries. So it's interesting to sort of keep that in mind and keep in mind that there are different audiences here, um, and particularly different audiences for these different sectors at different times of year. And then the other thing I wanted to point out for circulation over time is that, right, our audiobooks have been really steadily growing and surprisingly have not shown that post 2020 dip that we're seeing in the ebooks. And also, right, we can see here these um, are getting very close. And I would expect that in the next year or two, right, audiobooks might actually overtake ebooks in terms of number of circulation. So that's definitely something we want to keep in mind is that we, it really seems like audiobooks are consistently just a growing wave that we want to keep on top of. So another part, right, we have data about all of the books that have been circulating, but we also have all of our purchasing history. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the purchasing and cost trends that I found. 
And before I get into the details, I want to give a bit of an overview of how the licensing works um, through our vendor because, right, it's a bit complicated, although many of you are probably already familiar with this, but the licensing options and our prices, right, are set by publishers, and we know publishing is dominated by those big five corporations, right? We've got our Harper Collins, Penguin Random House, Hatchet, Macmillan, Simon and Schuster, right? And they make up the not, I believe not, I don't remember if it's actually the majority, but they are certainly right, the largest publishers that we're purchasing from. And each of those publishers has a different way that they do licensing and also like a different way that they set price points. And so, and it's worth keeping in mind that while there is a variety of license types, usually the person purchasing for a specific title doesn't have a choice, right? It's, you want Je Jeanette McCurdy's um, hit new memoir, there's one price point, one license type. You can either get it or not. The one exception to this is sometimes we can choose between a one or a two year license. Um, but yeah, generally, right, we've got a variety of license types, but only one license usually per title. In general, our audiobooks are mostly a perpetual license, right? Which means you buy it once, you have it forever. Um, an, uh, one person checks it out at a time, but as many, right, once it's back in, anyone else can take it. We just repeat that. Um, sometimes audiobooks will have a limited one, two year license. The ebooks have more of a variety, right? Sometimes they're still perpetual, or we generally see um, a license that is limited either by time, most commonly one or two years, sometimes more, or by number of circulations, right? And the most common there is 26. We also see from some of the smaller publishers more complicated things that is like um, either two years or X number of circulations, whichever happens first. But these are the most common licenses that we see. And the reason I um, give this background information is, right, we want to be sure when we're talking about this that we're not comparing apples to oranges, right, that we understand the different licenses. So I want to talk about um, some of the trends that we've seen. And one of them is that our audiobooks used to be, it used to be a given that if we bought an audiobook, it would be a perpetual license. But since 2019, we are seeing a rise in two-year licenses. And again, I want to remind people, right, it's not that our librarians are deciding to purchase two-year licenses. Instead, it is now the publishers are offering that as their option. And we want to keep in mind, right, that like, if we think long-term about the collection, even if the two-year licenses were cheaper, it would still, in general, the perpetual is always going to be a better investment, right? The best thing for libraries is always going to be um, an unlimited license. However, it's interesting to note, right, that it isn't even necessarily true that those two-year licenses, the far less favorable ones, would be cheaper, right? I see two, I've got two of the big five here who have made the switch from perpetual to two-year for their audiobooks. And we can see, right, that the pricing, right, as we're changing over time from these perpetual to two-year licenses, the two-year licenses aren't, they're at about the same price point as the perpetual. So with this change, right, libraries are paying the same amount for a far less favorable license type. And here I've got a breakdown of the price points for a right audio on the top and then ebook here for each of the publishers right and it's a little bit hard to visually parse this because there are so many publishers right but we can see here that um the typical the publisher with the highest typical audio price is Simon and Schuster and again this most expensive license that we're seeing this is a two year one the Simon and Schuster uh compared to say Harper Collins charges more for a less favorable license. And we can also see that down here with the eBooks as well. And this is part, er, I think goes hand in hand with uh, another trend that we're seeing that is worrying, which is in general, libraries are paying way more for digital materials than consumers are. This 2023 ALA report found that on average, libraries are paying three times as much. And I found that this bears out with the purchasing numbers that we're seeing as well. So I've got some examples here. This is a title of an audiobook from each of these big five publishers. I just pulled right a random book that has an average 
price point for us and then looked up what it would cost on Audible, right? And we can see with all of these, they're far, far cheaper for a consumer buying it on Audible than we are paying for. And these Audible licenses, right, the consumer is buying this perpetually. So again, we're paying far, far more for some of these, a two-year license rather than perpetual. So these trends I bring up because it seems like there is a concerning shift, right, in the way that publishers are approaching licensing and pricing in that, right, again, it's dominated by these big five who are controlling the market. And then for any given title, they have essentially a monopoly on that title, right? They can charge however much they want for Jeanette McCurdy's memoir. And at least right when it came out, Jeanette McCurdy's memoir was in very, very high demand. So libraries don't actually have a lot of negotiating power in this system as prices are continuing to be high for less generous licensing. Um, and one thing that can help with that, right, is the recently passed in June of this past year was the License to Read Act, um, which involves the state library, state librarian. Um, these are, right, some of the phrases that I pulled from the description of the bill, um, including negotiating with publishers, awarding grants, and help libraries work in cooperation for sharing electronic resources. And this is really exciting. I think we're still waiting to see all of the ways that this will be implemented and play out, but it's definitely an exciting step to give libraries more power in the, right, this disparity for how much we're being charged for e-resources for those unfavorable licenses. So we've talked about circulation and we've talked about cost, and now I wanna bring both of those together and consider the cost per circulation. So right now, right, if we add up all our circs and all our spending, we're at about $1.17 cost per circulation. And if we look at this graph, we can see, right, that, that that cost has gone way down over time exponentially. And this is in large part because, right, especially at the beginning, we we're buying a lot of perpetual licenses. And those perpetual licenses are a great investment because you buy them once and even if they're expensive, especially if they're like classic books that are gonna be perennially popular, they're still available. Um, and so they keep getting more circulations without accruing more cost. But right, there's the caveat that as these licensing terms may change, right, this is not something we can take for granted the way that this graph is going. So now I wanna break down um, cost per circ in some different categories. First off, right, we've got format, and we can see that our ebooks, right, are cheaper. It's a cheaper cost per circulation than audiobooks. And I've also got here, right, an average price and the circulations per unit. And it's interesting if we look at circulations per unit, we see audiobooks are actually more popular than ebooks, right? Uh, there's a pretty big gap here. And, right, we can keep in mind from earlier, audiobooks are. Um, a rising trend, probably going to continue to become more popular, but they still have a higher cost per circ because they are just so much more expensive. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, right? Our cost per circ, which is sort of our return on investment, um, isn't just based on popularity, it's based on this relationship of popularity and price. And now I've got this broken down by license. And again, I know this, this table is a little overwhelming. We've got a lot of numbers here. Um, but right, unsurprisingly, our best cost per circ item is going to be those perpetual ebooks because their price point is pretty reasonable and they are fairly popular in terms of circulation per unit. Um, I think it's interesting to point out here that the 26 circulation license actually does better than the two year. I think the 26 circ gets a bad rap, right? Just this idea of, oh, it feels less fair to like specify the number of circulations. But the 26 circulations, um, because they're so limited in their circulations, they are actually priced a lot lower. So they end up being not too bad of a deal and a better deal compared to those two years. And we can see if we look at the audiobooks here, again, a really big disparity between those perpetual licenses, which audiobooks all used to be, and the two year. And again, we're seeing, again, the two year isn't cheaper than the perpetual, and they just have a much lower circulation per unit because they're going to disappear after two years. 
So that's the breakdown by license. And then my final breakdown that I wanted to show is our top genres by circulations per dollar, right? And again, unsurprisingly, we can see that our comics and graphic novels for adults and children are going to be sort of our best genres in terms of return on investment. And this is right there about for every dollar spent three or three and 350 or sorry, 3.5 circulations. And we can see, right, that's because they are very popular. We saw earlier, right, that particularly children comics were dominating children's and they're pretty reasonably priced. And then some of our other genres that we can see is, right, the adult Amish Mennonite Christian. Again, less popular, not a dominating genre, but very reasonably priced compared to other options. And then our just general children's is very, very popular and in general, a lower price point than both adult and teen titles. So those are the summaries of the data that I've been looking into for eRead. Um, I would love to switch over to a Q&A now and give people a chance to ask any questions they have or sort of reflect on these trends, how they align with what you've seen, and also how these trends with digital items might be different than what you're seeing for physical items in libraries. So I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Quinn. And uh, you can put your questions into the chat. Uh, if people want to raise their hand, we can call on you to unmute. Um, I'm sure you all are formulating your questions uh, as as you as we go here. But Quinn, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I think there, there's so this there's so much impactful information in this. I love that there are. I love that there's kind of the national trends. You know, I love that there's trends local to Illinois. Um, I think there's so much to to take away. From this. So um, Diane says, yeah, this, that's very true. Diane says, I envy you for being able to access and analyze this data. My favorite types of analysis. Yeah, absolutely. And Quinn did a fantastic job. Uh, Jason asks, was that 54,000 active patrons or 54,000 total patrons signed up for eRead? Uh, let's see. I believe this was in the 2023. Let me... Yeah, so this is um, not just patrons signed up. These are patrons who checked out um, a material during 2023. So yeah, active patrons. Good question. Thank you, Jason. I think I think some of my favorite information um, has to be just the the pricing information, right? And it feels like that is the area where we might be able to make make it right, make a difference, right? May, and make a difference for libraries as a whole, rather than just uh, rather, rather than just individually. Uh, Ashton asks, did the data indicate any change in user behavior after the transition to boundless? Is that is that in the data, Quinn? That's a really excellent question and not something that I actually consider checking because I'm right coming into this project newer. Um, yeah, it's not something that is specifically in the data, but definitely something we could look at based on knowing when that switch happened. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you, but I will definitely keep that in the back of my mind as something to look into because it's a good question. It is a really good question. I suspect that it's going to be something that we will have to research over time. Right, and and the, those those trends will eventually kind of reveal themselves as uh, as we go go along here. Uh, Nicole asks, "What is the average hold wait time for the bestsellers?" Oh, that's a really good question. And again, uh, I feel bad that I can't pull up uh, an exact number for you right now. I know that um, something that our team, our purchasing team, prioritizes is keeping those hold ratios really low. Yeah, um, and. So they will right invest more, and oh, I forget. I believe the typical hold ratio that they aim for is like three for, especially for popular items. But yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head, but I definitely know that that is something that our team is keeping in mind and prioritizing, right, reducing the wait time for those bestsellers. Yeah, and Nicole, if you contact uh, us at Rails, we could probably give you that information, um, especially if you you know. I, I don't know if this is something that you have a specific title in mind or a group of titles. We can help you sort of look up that information and, and let you know. So 
um, we'll, we'll put our information in the chat there. Uh, Gwen asks, how has the number of participating libraries changed over time and how does that affect the totals? Yeah, that's a really good question and one element that we've looked at as well. Yeah, um, the number of participating libraries has grown over time, although, right, and the populate the general population represented by eRead has grown over time as well. So that definitely is boosting our circulation as we're getting in new libraries. And I think something to keep in mind as that is happening is the changing ratio of school versus public libraries because they have very different purchasing needs as well. And I believe, I would have to double check on this, but I think we saw a big surge in interested libraries because of the pandemic in both public, but I think particularly in schools as well. And so that as that became a higher percentage of the number of libraries participating that also became a bigger priority in the collection. I can confirm. I can confirm that the in in two thousand in twenty twenty there was a huge influx of uh, especially schools joining e read Illinois, um, and it became a, a much bigger program um, than than it had been previously. But I think people were just recognizing, you know, obviously people were recognizing the value of ebooks and audiobooks at that time in a way that they hadn't previously uh, before that. So, um, Jason asks, do you have a total count of patrons registered? Also, a total possible patrons, i.e. total patron count for all libraries that are part of eRead. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know if we have registration. It, it Registered user data is not something that Baker and Taylor has been sending us as part of their reports, right? I'm just seeing the users that are listed when they check things out, but that would be a really good thing. Um, I'm going to note that we should ask them about that because it would be good to see, right, of the registered users, how many are actually active. Uh, um, and then Ashton asks, uh, Quinn, would you be willing to make your slides available? And actually, they'll be available. Uh, would they be available as a board doc? No. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you can just send them to me, and I will uh, include a link to them in the out. That's okay with you, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking, Ashton. That's that's a great question. Uh, for to to go back to Nicole's question about um, specific uh, like wait times, uh, I'm putting the email address. It's just info at ereadillinois.com, and that is a great place to ask about. Um, wait times, hold times and waits, uh, especially if you're looking for specific titles. Ted asks, I wonder if you have or could get any access to link referral data to see how patrons reach the ebooks. Be useful to know how many patrons are referred into Boundless from a catalog discovery system or over those who start on the website or on the app. Yeah, Ted, that's that's a great point. I I don't think we have access to that data right now. I don't think that that's something uh, we we could help you with uh, right now. But I I think we could probably look into that in the in the future for sure. Other questions? Other questions about Quinn's uh, presentation or materials here? Also, welcome any reactions that people have, any any surprises, anything catch you uh, off guard or uh, or surprise you about the, especially about the landscape of ebooks here. Yeah, it, it is it is quite a cool project. Oh, this is this is a good one. Nicole says, "Who seems to be the most expensive publisher?" Oh, that's a very good question. Let me see if I can pull. Oh, yeah, I almost included that as a slide. And then I decided that the license was perhaps more easier to parse. But give me one moment, and then I can actually share my screen. Um... While you're 
while you're pulling that up, Quinn, uh, Elaine uh, said, I had no idea about the virtual or sorry, perpetual versus two year licenses. That's not a thing so much for academic ebooks. Yeah, very, very good point. And, um, you know, I, I don't this this doesn't really go in this project didn't really go into too much with academic ebooks. But that that's from what I understand, that's just a very different landscape uh, in it in itself. Oh, actually, I'm realizing I don't need to pull it up from a file. It, I believe, actually, yeah, this. So this is uh, for specifically 2023 costs. Um, and so we're seeing right that for um, audiobooks are, are most expensive, again, and these are of the big five, it's going to be the Simon & Schuster. And then the most expensive in terms of ebooks is going to be Hatchet. Um, but again, sort of keeping in mind, right, to not do apples and oranges, right, that the the yellow here is a two-year license and the green is perpetual. But uh, concerningly, and maybe not surprisingly, right, our most expensive ones are also those two-year licenses. But yeah, I think, I think this chart sort of shows that breakdown for publisher. Other questions? Other other uh, areas that people want to dig into? Oh, great. Jeanette, what about most expensive when you look uh, at a cost per circ? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here, let me pull that up. Okay, give me one second. I'm going to reshare my screen to show a different tab. Yeah, so sorry, this is a little bit messy looking. Um, <laughs> it's also but... very impressive looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here. Uh, we can see that, yeah, sort of if we look at cost per circ, right, sorry, I didn't sort these, um, but our sort of cheapest publisher in terms of cost per circ is going to be HarperCollins. And we're seeing the highest cost per circ for Macmillan. And again, right, we can see we've got the typical invoice price here. And we can see, right, this is not surprising because HarperCollins just in general tends to have um, a cheaper price point. Um, while still, right, this is circulation rate still being pretty popular. Just so people know, can you explain what you're what you're looking at? Like what 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 software are you using? How 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 do you even re read this? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's, um, it's it's a bit intimidating looking. Yeah, but I'm just it is. yeah. One of the things that was cool about my program is I got to focus uh, on learning coding in Python, and so this is like an environment where I'm using Python to basically read through all of the different files we have about everything in eread and i can write queries and ask it to show me right all of the data brought together and so this is my um somewhat unorganized uh python environment where i can write code well it's really cool and and matt says this screen makes me want to dust off the python that i took in library school but haven't used it <laughs> awesome. yeah but maybe it'll inspire all of us <laughs> i don't know about me i don't know if it's Something I'm going to get into, but um, <laughs> maybe there are others out there. Yeah, Jeanette's into it. <laughs> oh, cool. I Well, I'm glad that you gave us the kind of, so uh, this is fun because it, it's kind of giving us a background, Quinn, and a little bit of what you do and how you do it. Um, and just, get, you know, giving people a sense of um, the, the really hard work of, you know, breaking down all of those uh, data points and different data sources and things like that in order to investigate that. Um, you know, uh, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, Diane says, devil's advocate here, I was surprised at the low cost per circulation overall. Publishers may change, charge libraries more than individuals, but when you compare the price individuals pay versus library cost per circ, individuals are the losers, if I understand your, your charts correctly. Yes, definitely. And I think that's one of the things that um, makes e-read really exciting or right, like part of why the... Um, the License to Read Act, part of what they included there was setting up things for research, resource sharing, right? Is 
we are paying far more, but reaching a wider audience. And again, right, the there's a lot more power whenever, right, the, the, the pool is larger and the resource sharing is happening, right, of like, yeah, it, it's still relative, it's an extremely good price to, right, only have a little over a dollar for one circulation, one chance to read things. And I think that's one of the ways, like, outside of trying to negotiate with publishers that libraries can sort of rectify this um this price imbalance is um by right working together and yeah i was also looking at some of the data in terms of like what m members of member libraries of rails are paying in terms of their fees and like how right how long into the year have you um made back your fees right and it's like very very quickly because if these libraries were trying to individually buy these titles for all of their patrons right it would just be a huge cost and so right the, the more that the resource sharing is happening I, th I think it's one of the strongest tools libraries have here J J jason has a good question does the cost per circ include any fees for belonging to e-read illinois um not not in this setup no because I, i'm looking at sort of the yeah, just the um, the the costs that like are being paid to the vendor to obtain the items. Thank you. Thank thanks for that clarification, Jason. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give people um, just a couple more minutes to ask questions. Um, if if anyone has any final questions uh, for Quinn, um, please feel free to ask them. And if not, um, we can bring this to a close. I'll say this is a great discussion. I knew that Rails member libraries would bring their their, their great questions, their great feedback uh, to this. So uh, Ted says, so cost per circ per specific library would be would then be a new breakdown. Yes, that's my understanding. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane says, the biggest drawback for patrons is the problem of expiration of access when licenses expire. Definitely. We need to do a better job of letting patrons know the libraries are really leasing content rather than purchasing. Fantastic point, Diane. Yeah, that, that's a really good one. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I, right, I, I was surprised to learn this myself. And again, I'm relatively new to the field. But like, as a patron, yeah, I definitely just always assumed that the libraries owned ebooks the way they do physical books. And I think that was also something I saw in that ALA report that I was looking at, right? Is there's um, a big disconnect between, right? Patrons don't really understand this the way this purchasing works and also don't always understand that like, for example, the Libby app, and but that's OverDrive, like is connected to their local library and that their local mm -hmm. library is paying for that. So uh, I definitely think, yeah, it's important for, us to yeah communicate that to patrons so they have like a a better sense of what the landscape is. It's interesting when you go to a, like a you know party or something and you talk to somebody about ebooks and you mention that you know libraries don't own the ebooks. Um, a lot of times you end up like blowing somebody's mind, um, and it's either makes you the like most interesting person at the party or potentially the least interesting person at the party, right? Depending on the crowd. Um, and and but but the licensing thing is is a surprise to most people. Most people think it's just like a physical book. You buy the book, it's yours, right? And we have the opportunity to resell it, but the licensing thing um, puts a snag in that for sure. Uh, Ashton says, one way Rails could add to Quinn's work uh, would be to share with members how e-read is funded and a breakdown of how the other dollars, uh, how the dollars are spent. Yeah, thank you, Ashton, that's great. I, I think we can, definitely, um, we can definitely approach something about that. And certainly I know that, you know, there's a new funding, uh, there's a, um, as a new funding structure for e-read. And I know a big part of it has been um, to make sure that we have a collection um, that represents all of our member libraries and um, is able to kind of fund um, e-read. One thing that I'll note is, as you all probably know, you know, e-read is this 10-year-old um, program. Uh, the funding uh, for it originally came from the Illinois uh, State Library. They were sort of subsidizing it. And since then, it's moved to much more of a self-sustaining through fees thing. So. Uh, Ashton, I, I, your point is well taken. Uh, and J Jeanette, thank you for sharing the, um, the the blog post. More information there. If you are if you are if you are really interested in strongly interested in your uh, in your ebook audiobook um, pricing uh, information and uh, and research, 
uh, we have plenty of that for you. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Karen says 100% of your an your annual fee goes to further developing the shared collection. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Yep. Um, any other questions for Quinn? Well, uh, unless I see anything else, Quinn, thank you so much for being willing to bring this uh, to a forum where people could ask questions. Uh, again, great discussion. I really appreciate you being willing to, to do this. Um, I'm so excited about this project. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, it's just bringing a lot more transparency to the ebook and audiobook world for a lot of us. So um, thank you all for coming. Again, you will receive a, a link to the recorded version of this, uh, hopefully tomorrow or Friday. Um, and we appreciate you taking some time out of your noon today to join us. Uh, have a great Wednesday, and we will see you all later. Thanks so much, everyone.